Welcome to the Gregarious Marvel Podcast. This is Chris. And this is Kate. It's been a while. Um, we had a big backlog of interviews to clear. We've been on holiday. Uh, we've been busy. All those usual blah, blah excuses. But we are finally back with a discussion show. And what's the uh, topic of discussion this time, Kate? Yeah, I think the main topic of um, this podcast today is Eva, which is kind of like a German answer or a European answer to see yes. It's yeah. consumer electronics um, Mostly, in a yes. very large space, everything from your high tech to your, to your lower tech, from hair dryers to robots to, I don't know, Hair dryer robots. Um, home kits. Hair dryers to home kits. Well, yeah, you missed my pun there, but anyway. Hair drying robots. <laughs> Everything from hair dryers to robots and hair dryer robots. I'm sure there was one somewhere. Well, or probably a voice controlled hair dryer. I mean, that's an interesting point, I've got to say. As someone who's quite fond of robots, I did find this year's offerings a little bit underwhelming. I mean, Pepper came out again. To do a bit of a wave and a bit of a dance and, you know, do the, the usual greetings that people like. Um, there was yeah. there was a lot of dancing robots. So we had robots dancing in, in unison, which we know people is um, quite, a, quite a popular pastime to observe. So in summary, I guess we're saying that there was nothing standout at EFA this year. It was kind of more of the same of last year. Uh, I think if I look back on my common threads... There's a lot of the same. A bit of consolidation, mm. uh, Google Assistant everywhere. Yeah, but nothing particularly new. There's a couple of small things we're going to discuss, but was that your general feelings, Kate, or something else? Yeah, I mean, I think it was kind of, like you said, there was a consolidation of there being a lot more partnerships between brands. There was... Um, uh, small, small, you know, sequels of earlier iterations of products. Um, but most of it really was the same things as last year, the same offerings, um, the same demonstrations. So it was hard to get really exciting. Okay. Well, we've already said we weren't very excited, but let's uh, try and keep people listening <laughs> before they just switch off because it's not going to be a very exciting episode. And let's uh, go into a few things. Um, I don't know how many you have on your list, but let's sort of ping pong a bit. So what would you like to cover first, Kate, off of your list? I think smart homes, actually. Mm-hmm. At this year's EFA, there was certainly... Um, smart homes out in force, the usual kind of suspects were all there um, from Nest to, to Google to, you know, the the doorbell people like Ring. But there, I think the thing that I found that was um, a little bit new this year was some of the big players in traditional industries had bought out their own products. For example, Bosch and Siemens both had connected kitchens where they were putting a lot of kind of collateral into Creating a, um, as as uh, Siemens put it, a connected life. So the idea of that trajectory from, you know, joining the front doorbell to your kitchen uh, appliances and the laundry and all those different permutations, lighting, heating, of, of course, et cetera, et cetera. And really trying to get the products hawking to each other a little bit more by having them on kind of a consistent platform. And actually this feeds a little bit into, we've been uh, recently working on a review of the Conrad Connect platform, which does this with smaller devices, um, but they're looking to expand quite a lot. We'll also have an interview with their uh, product manager soon coming up on the feed. Um, But I'm actually looking at a photo here from the Siemens booth. I think one thing we both discussed whilst we were there was there's a lot of still a lot of connectivity where it's not particularly helpful like Mm. a connected washing machine that tells you when it's done i mean i don't know so what it still doesn't empty the washing machine Um, exactly or load it yeah i I don't know or turn the. i mean it may i I don't know if it turned if you could turn the dryer on remotely because i know in america a lot of people have those washer dryers where it's the same machine that could have been a good offering for example and they may have well have had that there's still still just to be a lot of places where it's like and so what it's not that hard to find out the status of my washing machine really i don't know yeah (laughs) yeah i mean i guess 
I think the fact that the big people were getting into it makes me wonder about maybe they're trying to take over a market that's failed largely because of the lack of um, interoperability. I mean, there are certainly smart home products that are more popular than others. I think the most popular being the security cameras in um, the US and also the lighting and cooling, sorry, heating and cooling systems. Uh, but, you know, really trying to move into automating other products. And, to, and so one of the reasons for that, I think, is really getting ready for that um, subscription as a service model. For example, mm. the... Um, the tabs or the you know the powder that you put in the um, the washing machine or the dishwasher, uh, items from the refrigerator. The idea being that you know you can um, have those delivered uh, in that the machine is able to recognise when they're running low and and place an order. Presumably with Amazon, it could be someone else and, here in Europe. And actually, one of the points you've brought up in previous years and previous episodes was if you have the fridge, the bin. The, the whatever else ordering, mm. how do you prevent having multiple things ordered? And exactly. there's actually one thing I brought up with the Conrad Connect people. Mm. And something they're looking to try to do is by the consolidation, you end up with, yeah, if three things are asking to order milk, but you've set a threshold of only one milk per week, mm. then it only orders one, not three. Yeah. Things like that, which, which is... Um, I, mean, I don't know. It does again to be smack of uh, engineers inventing something to solve a problem we never had. But yeah, yeah but, it's, true. it's also know. worth noting that I mean the products I saw sort of everywhere. That I mean the smart products specifically were all really nice to haves rather than essentials. Mm. Well, that's and I'm not sure. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I mean that's that's a point to make. I mean, I realise we sound very cynical and a bit a bit kind of like eh, it's all crap. But I think the reason being is that we are, are people that like to write about the essentials, things that change people's lives for the better. And I think that some of this is starting a change. They're trying to get people, you know. Is, um, the trust element of a place that's fairly conservative like Germany, when you see these big German companies out there uh, with their show kitchens talking about it in German, mm. you get consumers going, ah, you know, this is something we could do. And bear in mind, there are some, some practical issues because, for example, in much of Europe, people rent mm. rather than buy. So making structural changes to your property may, may be a more arduous process than, mm. than otherwise. There's also a real demarcation between people who want it, want the whole setup done for done for themselves by someone else, or um, people that you know are happy to tinker and do it all themselves. So that can also be a challenge. I'd also like to dig into one final aspect here before we go into a new variety of subscription service we saw quite a lot of. Um, I would like to call up. I'm not going to call out any names, but um, already with a lot of this uh, connected uh, homes, we're falling, or well, manufacturers, not we, are falling into a little bit of uh, gender stereotyping, um, mm. which, I, which annoyed me. It's kind of, it's not the 1950s anymore. Not every ad for home appliances has to have women in it with their kids, and you don't always have to use uh, very gendered language in the ads and things like that. I, I don't know, and I know there's certain reasons why companies do this to appeal to particular people, but... Yeah, I guess I would mm. like to hope the companies thought consumers were better than that, but maybe maybe we're not. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it works, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would say there, though, I think a lot of the, the products in this kind of smart home area were really targeting families. That seemed to be a real... But with a very strong of, amount of a women connected, in those pictures. So. A connected heteronormative family, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so we did see that kind of thing a bit a bit too much. Yeah. Say. And another subscription service we saw popping its head up, which was different and unexpected. I saw in a few places. The ones I will mention, I think, were Bosch and Plant Ui which may start to give you an indication of what it was. But there were these curious kind of connected pods that you could grow herbs and small vegetables in. And they kind of follow the coffee capsule model mm. of having mm. the seeds in a capsule. Mm. I think this was interesting. And I guess it would be relatively efficient it bothered me because you have to plug it in, which made me wonder, was the waste of electricity worth the savings in other places? Who knows? Um, 
but also the waste of the pods. I couldn't get a straight answer from anybody if maybe the pods biodegraded because that would... I would have thought so. You would hope yeah. so, but yeah. I wouldn't assume it. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that is the normal practice in aeroponics. So I've actually visited an aeroponic um, yeah. factory, one of those really big ones with the microgreens and herbs and stuff. And that's really what they were pushing for this, you know, microgreens and herbs. Have it plugged in and you can have them during the winter or what have you. And I think that it's worth noting that they're not the first people to do this. IKEA has been doing oh, really? okay. a, a lower version of this for about five years. I did not know that. Okay. Um, okay. There Fair is enough. a lot of kits available. There's a lot of stuff there already. But the thing I think they're doing differently is that kind of uh, pod as a service where you can you can purchase the seeds. And there, one of the guys made a little bit of a joke to us about um, it being quite a popular product that they were – you know, testing in California with a certain type of seeds, mm. as I'm sure mm. you can imagine. It's worth saying, too, that um, Bosch, when we spoke to them about it, it was very much about trialing yep. and prototyping. Yep. They weren't at the release or anything like that. They were getting the response. And, and bear in mind, a, a city like Berlin, I would say probably at least 80% of people, if not more, don't have a garden. We have a small balcony. Um, many of many are unsuitable for growing things because of the, the size. Uh, and, and, you know, so it, having something inside could be quite popular. Wow. And I was actually telling Chris the other day, I went to a, a shopping centre in Moabit here in Berlin, and there was a... Um, not only a, a startup kind of incubated there or startup space, but the supermarket actually had a little um, aeroponic pop up uh, greenery growing herbs and um, lettuces that you could buy. So you could watch them technically, you know, the layers where you have the lights in different rows. Um, in quite a high, it looked like a big fridge, I guess you'd say, mm. with with lots of bright purple lights and and things growing, and you could basically um, buy them buy them on the on the on the shelf that that had been grown in the store, which I think is a, a really interesting way to do it. And I suspect this could become a bigger trend. Well, we should uh, maybe go and investigate that for a future episode. Definitely, okay. we could do a little video, perhaps. So I remain unconvinced by this pot as a service, but we will see. Uh, I was unconvinced by the coffee machines and people love them. So we shall see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's. I'm going to have a quick, a very quick micro topic uh, that probably I don't know if Kate will comment on or not. But um, I guess we saw an increased return of older companies you thought were dead. Um, Kodak had uh, was selling a lot of projectors which is mm. not so new. They've been doing that for a little while. The other interesting one I saw was that Polaroid have now started making laptops, <laughs> which <laughs> I found kind of weird. Um, but also there were Segway, the company everyone loves to hate uh, or uh, <laughs> loves to love. I don't know. Um, not really a dead company, but with a lot of new products. But something very interesting happened with them, which I'm yet to confirm. <laughs> so don't take this as gospel. But... Uh, they were ripped off majorly by a Chinese company called Nimbot. And apparently Nimbot bought Segway, which I find quite fascinating. And they were there together on one booth uh, trying to kind of make Segways look a little bit cooler with like shoppers that follow you, uni wheels, mm. which are banned in lots of countries still. Mm. Uh, these weird like Segway roller skate things, a whole mm. bunch of stuff. Um, if any of the developers out there, they actually have uh, – some of them actually run on Android, so you can hook them up to apps and all sorts of things. But, yeah, just a couple of kind of older companies that were sort of back, I suppose, which was interesting. Yeah, and I think uh, you've hit on something there. I mean, we mentioned the robots earlier, and I think that's a real push towards having functional robots in the home as a kind of – I don't know, a home helper would probably be the term – and look, to be fair, you, you've basically got the functionalities of an iPad or a, an iPhone or any type of phone, I guess, on a in, we're embedded in a robot. So you've got your Alexa, you've got your calendar, you've got um, you may have facial recognition depending on the robot. Mm. I guess the point of difference is that it follows you around. It it can, it may talk to you. Um, it may provide some kind of entertainment or. By direct um, or by virtue, child mining. <laughs> but, you know, in terms of robots that actually really do help you, there wasn't much. The only one I really saw that I liked was a, 
a guy that was actually staffing someone else's booth, but he said, when we were talking to him, he said, oh, by the way, I've got this product yeah. and showed us on his phone. And it was, it, it basically looked like a table on wheels. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was, uh, Electric, I guess. I assume it's electric. Um, that was for people that, you know, had disabilities and couldn't carry stuff around the house. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. That's a very practical product. I think a lot of them it, are still just new products. It's not that uh, people aren't making them um, mm. and getting the cost down, I suppose, as well. That's true. Um, let's dig into our next topic, which mm-hmm. is curiously we're going to call new standards. Uh, so I'm going to start very quickly with one that I think you missed, Kate, uh, and then we're going to go to one that I know quite interested you. So we've heard a lot, and uh, Kate has mentioned it in the past, about 5G and uh, ZTE, ZTE, the company that America tried to ban, or <laughs> actually had very, very mutely on display, uh, hence you probably missed it, um, prototypes of 5G smartphones, 5G tablets, and 5G routers. Um, and it's weird. There was no song and dance about this at all. They were very bland looking, just sat there under some glass. But I found that kind of interesting to actually finally see some devices that consumers will use that support 5G. Um, yeah. Uh, I know you missed that completely. So <laughs> I did. I'm afraid I did. I tried to wave at you and then you'd gone on to something else. So, uh. <laughs> But then the other one was uh, somewhat related to 5G. Um, maybe you'd like to go into uh, the the slightly uninteresting but very interesting booth we came across. Yeah, and I will be writing something about this. This was URLE Alliance, yeah. which I can't quite remember what the actual letters stand for. But it was basically, um, I guess, a, a technology for use in the, um, in the home for smart products. And so what they were looking at, the main kind of areas, I guess, were home automation, security and climate control in primarily residential, but also enterprise environments. Mm. So in terms of functionality, I think the main thing they were really pushing or or in terms of, I guess, the secret stall, the main thing they were pushing in the first instance was that it was ultra low energy. So that's the ULE. I just worked that out. (laughs) Um, So it used a low amount of energy. Secondly, it's easier to install than perhaps LP WAN or um, one of the other alliances, um, the cellular alliances. Or well, the, the crucial thing was it leveraged existing technology already. That was my next point. Chips and devices. Yeah, that was my next point. Yeah. Which so yeah. it can. It also is is based on established technology, DECT, for example. It can also in, um, have voice and SMS integrated within it, which I thought was quite interesting. And it's just you know it, it seems that it's a it's a it's not a new technology but it's a new kind of application and it's a new uh, I guess a new marketing you know this I mean the, the alliance as as an organisation are growing and I think they had a, they've got a lot of enterprises involved already of course but they're also providing things like ULE chips chipsets modules software and tools so I think this is something that is you know potentially quite interesting. And we're going to see a lot more about this you know because when the issue will end up actually consolidating on any of these standards. I mean, this is a stupid question to ask, I know, because uh, okay. I think that the same point could be made in many, many places. Like, why do you stop? When will you stop making standards and actually just stick to one? But uh... yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is an awareness and a, a desire of the need for standards to to kind of collaborate mm. and to. The problem is they all have such different players and different um, use cases and needs. Most of them do. <laughs> but they've, they're a fairly new kind of thing. This is fairly new. I think it's only been around for a couple of years, mm, about mm. three years. So I think 2015 they started this this um, alliance, if you like. So it's certainly something that I'll be writing a bit about for the website and um, you can certainly find out a lot more about it there. And and the I guess the... The genesis of the alliance comes out of Switzerland, which is interesting. Okay, on the subject of people creating competing standards that we may or may not need, um, I have one of the newfangled MacBooks with the touch bar. Uh, 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 It's probably my summary of it. Um, But that didn't stop uh, other computer manufacturers trying to invent their own equivalents of the touch bar. Mm. Um, if you already have one of the modern Windows machines with a touch screen, well, Asus decided that maybe you want a second touch screen. Uh, and instead of making a touch bar, which actually 
Firstly, I will say, I found someone with an old Lenovo ThinkPad that also had a touch bar. So Apple were not even the first to do it, but anyway. Mm. Um, but this is a bit different. It, it's like a, it's actually in the touchpad itself, and it's like a second miniature screen, kind of the mm. size of a smartphone screen. Um, and not only is it act as a normal touchpad, it also has previews, extra actions for certain applications, and they showed to me um, some demonstrations of it running with uh, Microsoft Office software and Adobe Creative Suite software, so sort of partially useful. Um, I don't know. Uh, these things, like the touch bar, have a tendency to look cool, but would they actually be useful? Mm-hmm. Remains to be seen. And it also rem- remains to be seen how many software companies actually develop anything for them. And this has been my main problem with the touch bar, is even if it was good, half the time I open an application and it's just a big blank space there. So oh, really? if it's not very consistent, then is it useful? Um, following up from that, I also saw, and I... I think it's got the same name. I have one of the original Lenovo yoga book things, which Mm -hmm. was small. Uh, It came in Android and Windows, Mm. and it ran like um, a Wacom tablet with a weird haptic keyboard uh, on the second side. It was kind of cool, slightly overpriced. Um, I think the biggest restrictions were Android, to be honest with you. Android wasn't really optimised for that. Lenovo did a lot of customizations, which they then had to maintain, and they didn't really. So it was a bit of a, an alpha product. And they've announced this new version, which is Windows only, and this second screen does way more. It has a keyboard, again, haptic. Interestingly, on the one I have, the keyboard was etched in, which seemed somewhat pointless because it meant Hmm. if I bought it in Germany, I'm locked to a German keyboard layout. And they acknowledged that as being Hmm. a fairly big flaw. Um, It's also an e-ink. It's not just a Wacom tablet. It's an e-ink display. So you can actually have the equivalent of reading on a Kindle on that second screen. Uh, And again, it's still a Wacom S tablet. You have a stylus. You can do drawing it. We saw a demo of them converting the handwriting to text in uh, Microsoft Word as well. So there is that interaction. It's still a very early product. It's bigger than the old one. And one of my main reservations, especially for reading on it, that it was a bit heavy. So this is going to be even heavier. Uh, the price has doubled. <laughs> um, so and who knows what about battery life? So mm. lots of people are experimenting with these kind of new form factors on the laptop tablet crossovers but um yeah same applies as with the asus really will it be widely adopted who knows and i know these are not things that interested you and you didn't really see yourself kate but um i i was quite excited and actually one other thing i will quickly mention because uh, i don't think enough people have mentioned it from ifa despite it being a fairly obvious one um so with android especially uh there was always this Nexus program, which they kind of killed off, like the ability, they they partnered with a hardware manufacturer to make like a pure Android experience, which they killed off in favor of the Pixel, which is actually not a pure experience. It's an enhanced Google experience. So there was a gap left for this kind of pure Android experience. And there is this series of Android One phones. Kate has one, the Nokia 6. So it runs pure Android. It has to be approved by Google. Not anyone could just whack it on. So it has to meet certain kind of standards. And uh, there were a lot of Android One phones announced at IFA, actually. Uh, Mm. I found that quite interesting, Um, especially a lot of them available only in Europe, which I also found interesting. That's interesting. Um, Yeah, there was quite a lot. There's BQ. There is the uh, Lenovo G7 One and a few others that were all Europe only. And it's always fun listening to American tech podcasts where there's something they can't get. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to our world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so there was a lot of interesting kind of things there. Of Again, a little bit of consolidation on the Android side. And I am keeping my eye on the LG 7 One. I'm waiting to see a price for it. And failing that, mm. I might go for one of the BQs. They're made in – well, they're not made. They're designed in Spain. And the nice people at the booth gave me a discount token. So, so, so I'm kind of waiting to see on the price of the other one. I have another week or so before the voucher runs out because uh, mm-hmm. uh, I like the pure experience, I must say. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you notice any of those things, Kate, or if you have any opinions on those. I don't know if I even went to the front area. I, I was kind of hanging around the smart cities, yeah. the smart home, the um, startup area. You know, we we did also go to Showstoppers, which is kind of like a little um, 
press event for startups that are at, appearing at the show. Mm. Unfortunately, most of the ones that went this year, because they have to pay to, I guess, be present, were ones we saw last year. Mm-hmm. But it was nice to have a chat. And I think that the main thing that, or what, two of the most common things I was seeing there was uh, earbuds. Yep, loads and loads of earbuds. Loads of earbuds and different permutations of chargers. <laughs> wireless chargers. And forms. Now Apple have made wireless chargers official. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even though they've existed for quite a while, uh, they're everywhere. <laughs> So we, we saw earbuds getting smarter. We saw them getting smaller. We saw battery life getting a lot better. We saw ones that had a little bit of AI embedded so they could um, be able to detect and change um, the audio based on your hearing quality, which mm. I think is very interesting. I found it very weird to use. I tried it, but I, I found it quite strange. I tried them and I quite liked them. The I guess the downside is you can hear yourself talking in this slightly... A bit like, you know, talking to a, a microphone. Yeah. But I think you get used to that fairly quickly. And it, it actually, to me, I could tell what was going on because it sounded to me like when I clean up our interviews from a noisy background. Mm. <laughs> and I've yeah. heard from several and, listeners on how distracting that can be. So imagine hearing like that all the time. Yeah, yeah and it's worth saying that the point of these kind of things were not just to be able to improve your hearing, but to hear your, improve your conversational hearing. Mm, so your mm, hearing yeah. between people and also with that, um, be able to also function as a phone. So you could push it, you know, put, you could click your, uh, or push something. I forgot tap. It was, I think it was tapping actually tapping the, um, the, the earphones would enable you to answer calls and take calls and things like that. Mm. Uh, and they also had had noise cancellation. So for the other end of it, where you just want quiet for quite quite working or what have you, which I thought was was interesting. And another interesting thing I saw uh, it were companies that were bringing voice assistants to other people's hardware. So the two I saw were mm. Frontier's Smart SDK, who I could never seem to get their attention to talk to, so I don't really know too much about it, and also Snips, a French company uh, doing something similar. They had some nice prototypes of uh, their sort of testing devices hooked up to coffee machines and things like that. But uh, we actually have a separate interview with them, which I will release in the next week or so, so you can hear more about what Snips are doing uh, mm-hmm. in a future episode. But that was also quite interesting. Um, basically, they were kind of bridging the dumb old old hardware to the newer mm. voice assistants, uh, which I've also found interesting there. I tell you what, have you got, before we wrap up on the main EFA, because we have a little separate event we'd like to discuss, do you have any standout hits, misses, like one, one, one of each or just one, hits, misses or just weird but crazy awesome ideas you'd like to mention? Hmm, I'm just thinking what were my hits and misses. Hits, uh, a couple of things I did like particularly, there was a um, someone working on a food delivery kind of integration service that was integrating into... Uh, some of the B2B or, or some of the, you know, the the enterprise products that were already around for um, food delivery, mm. uh, where, you know, where your fridge can make deliveries and all that, or order deliveries and such. And they were, I liked it because they were looking at alternatives to just Amazon because there are a lot of places that don't have Amazon, surprisingly. <laughs> uh, and they had quite some, some interesting little um, little quirks with their products. I won't, I won't say too much about it because I would like to get an interview. And I'll certainly link back to that. I think mine, I don't like doing hits and misses. I've kind of given my opinions, but the one cool product that I have absolutely no use for, but was kind of cool anyway, was something called Life, L-Y-F-E. And the Y has like a weird Swedish accent over it. Uh, And it was this strange electromagnetic thing. And they had a clock, a plant plot, a a clock, a plant pot, and a light bulb. (laughs) And mm. thanks to like a little electromagnetic motor, the the aforementioned like arms on the clock or the plant pot or the light bulb hovered and moved around this wooden base. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I know the product. Yeah, they they actually kickstarted that originally. And the the plant pot, for example, can take a reasonable weight. The clock can be mm. configured. The light bulb even even powers through the connection. 
Um, yeah, completely pointless and useless to me, but kind of cool to look at. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's one thing I did notice in the startup era. There was a lot of open source things and there was a lot of um, products where they were very open to developers being involved and um, coming on board and trying things out or seeing what they could do with them. And I'll make what I'll do is I'll make a little list and put it on our show notes of some of the companies because I, I literally can't remember all the names of them right now, but... I'll, I'll put them there for people. And then finally, so Kate mentioned the uh, Showstoppers event that we have been to at a few. We've been to Mobile World Congress one. We've been to the EFA one. Uh, we've been registered for the CES one. It's kind of uh, a little event, usually prior to the main event, where they invite uh, companies that want to get more press coverage and they invite the press and they ply them with free alcohol and food, which always goes <laughs> down well. And uh, as a second event at this year's IFA, they tried something different. For the past three years, there's actually been a side event to IFA, a little bit uh, away from the main venue called uh, Global, IFA Global, which is mostly full of Chinese companies that make mm. kind of generic white label devices for OEMs and ODMs, things like house brands in Walmart, house brands in Maplin, and house brands in Dixons, and house brands in Media Mart, Saturn, etc., wherever your local hardware store is, electrics hardware store is. Um, and just tons and tons and tons of stuff that you have probably seen without realising mm. and you had no idea who mm. makes them. I mean, the biggest Definitely. company known in this field is someone like Foxconn and we know mm. what they make, uh, but this is kind of more than more niche stuff. Mm. Um, and actually the host disc- uh, used a phrase that I quite liked of the biggest invisible niche. Uh, mm. and, and for some reason... And possibly they didn't even understand themselves based on some of our conversations. Some of these companies decided they wanted press coverage to make people more aware of them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what they were hoping to get out of it, but it was quite interesting, actually. Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Kate. Yeah, look, I think... um yeah, what I could, what from talking to some of the companies there, I got the impression they were trying to go from kind of making stuff for other people to being standalone mm. with their own products. For example, I was talking to a guy that was making um, solar charged um, little mini, mini refrigerators and coolers and eskies and that sort of thing that he'd been making for others, but now wanted to make for himself. And that was quite a nice product, actually. It would work really well for camping or some kind of travel, things like that. Mm. There was also one which I quite liked, which was a um, a fold-up. Okay, it started as a um, a little bi- a little scooter. Uh, you know, not not. I don't think it, I'm not sure if it was electric, but it was a scooter. And then you then the woman did some nifty nifty folding, I should say, and it became a little bicycle. <laughs> So that was quite a nice. I like I like the idea of being able to to change between the two. And I thought it was called the Wino Go, but it was actually called the Wind yeah. Go. So it's... Yeah, we quite thought the Wino Go was a quite quite a good idea, and you just need to put a little um, drinks holder on the side. It could be quite a nice trip home, you know, on your little bike. The other uh, uh, anecdote we heard from quite a few people, which I found interesting, was how for many of these companies, direct sales through sites like Amazon eBay, Kickstarter and uh, AliExpress have become such a massive part of their business, like tens of thousands mm. of units, mm. and they can bypass the the white labelling. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And you've probably seen a lot of these products and wondered, I guess that always the problem with them is you're never sure about the quality. Um, yeah. Yeah, Amazon was definitely mentioned by pretty much everybody mm, there mm, mm. when you say oh you know is this gone to market where can you buy it It was always amazon yeah if you weren't a, a shop of course yeah i also course. curiously squashed in the corner was a company that made uh off the shelf graphics cards for crypto mining um, oh, yeah, and they right. had them in oil cooling and they gave me a very curious usb stick that apparently lets me do some kind of mining and i've got a mixed Mixed opinions from friends and professionals whether I should actually plug it into my laptop or not. Uh, we'll see how I go with that uh, in the near future. Um, I think my favourite device at this event was the fitness bracelet, and it had like the sensors in just one bead of the bracelet, which was very inconspicuous, which I quite liked. Yeah, I mean, it's it was an interesting shift because we have seen kind of the the oscillation between the very obvious fitness wearables where people want people to know they're wearing them for a little bit of a status thing and also a, a hey, I'm a fit person kind of idea. Mm. 
and and the invisibles, the rings and the the more the less um, visible bracelets and necklaces and pendants and things like that. So it's interesting because um, I think that it shows that there is a, a niche for both, and that I guess there's always been a little bit of a criticism with some of the the traditional wearables that they're made for male hands and, mm, mm. you know, the size that they can be a bit clunky on women's hands and stuff like that. And this is just women saying it. They're not having a problem with the product. Mm. It's just the actual design. Um, whereas the, the I guess the more the jewellery aspect is, is a lot more compelling for a lot of people. Mm, mm. All right, Kate, that was our quick roundup of Aoife. We did spend masses mm-hmm. of time there and, as we already said, still sort of mixed feelings. So let's wrap up with other things we've written over the past period of time. I can't even remember how long it's been. So you want to kick off with maybe your last three articles and what they're about? I've been writing about a few different things. I've been writing about a new app for to enable you to check the safety and the vulnerabilities of your own smart home products. Another one. <laughs> well, this one's a little bit different okay. because it actually can can check them all and and be able to differ, differentiate between them in the app and it's by a company called um dojo by bulgard mm-hmm. an israeli company that i guess they got sort of taken over by bulgard and they they kind of their main product is quite an interesting one it looks like a pebble like a big pebble in your home and what what it actually is it's a um how would i describe it <laughs> i'm just thinking the best way to put it I guess it's a it's a digital security device, and what it what it enables you to do is it's, it's um it monitors the home network twenty four seven against cyber threats. So they use um, detection and prevention to identify and block the real time attacks. Uh, there's a smart firewall and encrypted web access to smart devices. So I guess you could think of it like an umbrella over all of your devices because. It's it's almost every day that we read something about a, either a vulnerability or a, an attack of some sort or something like that on our home devices. There's no minimum standards for security. Uh, there's no um, laws about the security of the of the products that we have, and there's lots of reasons why. But you know the fact that they've they've you know yes we've got our core product this big pebble, but now we're going to do this IoT vulnerability scanner where you can use the app. Um, you don't need the other product. And it just enables you to scan all the products connected to your home Wi-Fi network and see the vulnerabilities there. And then, of course, if you want to buy their product, you can do that or buy something else, of course. Uh, Let's see. I also probably my my main biggest kind of thing I've been writing about over the last few months is is the issue of data privacy and health data. And I guess that came out of um, in Australia, we had an introduction of a a database called My Health Record, and it had a lot of criticisms. Firstly, it was opt... You had to opt out, not opt in, and it's basically a database of people's health records online that um, sounds good when you first think about it because you kind of think, well, yeah, you know, I can have a all my health details in one place. I don't have to be constantly, you know, giving them to different doctors and all that sort of thing. So it could be... Access to at the moment to about about twelve thousand health organisations and about nearly a million health professionals in Australia, so doctors, pharmacists, physios, things like that. Mm. However, there were quite a few problems with it. For example, the, um, the the central health record could could identify if you were having treatment for any stigmatising conditions, whether it's um, something like Prozac or you're taking Valium or you're being treated for HIV or herpes. Um, there was also legislation around that was associated with it that allowed government-related authorities, including the police, courts and social services and the tax office, to access the patient records, which really makes us think about the um, a breach of doctor-patient confidentiality. And in, in the Australian media, and how much tension it's got internationally besides The Guardian, there's been a, a, a pretty big out, uproar. A lot of health professionals were opposed to it, saying it goes against what they actually need because it doesn't give you everyone's, um, everyone's files. It gives you a condensed version, so you can't actually get – you can't necessarily get what you need from it. Uh, and they also felt it did breach that – doctor-patient confidentiality and a lot of other reasons. So to have the health professionals go against it. And I think if you also put this in the context that it's a, it's a 
a product that has, has involved government ministers, it's involved legislation, it's involved government policy. Australia in the last five years has been in a pretty parlous state with um, our leadership. So you could imagine this getting um, becoming a product of the future where it can be sold to third parties or it can be um, you know given to health insurers or, or anything else. Okay, I, uh, I've got to very quickly mention some of the things I uh, worked on that I was pleased with that I think you should go and have a look at. Um, after going to many, many conferences where people from the African continent are very underrepresented, I last week went to a conference specifically for and attended by, well, not specifically by, but mostly by uh, entrepreneurs from Africa, which was very interesting, AfroLink here in Berlin. Um, and yeah, I learned quite a lot of interesting things about how how we think Africans consume technology and how they actually do, uh, what they need and what we think they need, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so I encourage you to go and read that article over on D Zone for a bit more detail. Before um, yeah, I won't go into any more detail here, but it was very mm. interesting. Very interesting to get completely different perspectives from what we normally do. Mm. Um, I also, we, it was on the podcast, but there's a bit more uh, around it in another article uh, where I interviewed uh, Io, the creators of Adblocker Plus and Flatter. Uh, again, this was the last episode, but if you go and read the article, there's a bit more around it. And finally, also was a podcast episode before that one, but again, the article has a bit more digging into detail uh, when I spoke with uh, Stefan Thomas, the ex CTO of Ripple, about his new Codius and Coil projects. Codius, especially, will be interesting to the developers out there. There's this increasing amount of these kind of like decentralized AWS projects uh, running on blockchain, which is sort of interesting. So, and hmm. that into that episode, we will now tell everybody that episode has been our most popular episode ever. So if you're listening to this it one has. and you didn't listen to that one, you should go back and have a listen to it. Um, Definitely. And, uh, but you should also just listen to every other episode as well, of course. But uh, Oh, naturally. Yes. All right, Kate. We, have, uh, we are now being told it is time to wrap up by the cat it is indeed. in our studio. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if there was ever a better indication of when it's time to quit, I think that is probably it. Hopefully you're not hearing her in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kate, how can people stay in touch with you? I'm on Twitter on Kate underscore... Lawrence, and that's Kate with a C, Lawrence with a W, or, or uh, you can contact me via katelawrence.com. That's, and what about you, Chris? How can they contact you? <laughs> I am at Chris Chinch on Twitter and chrischinchella.com on the rest of the internet. <laughs> I don't know. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next time. <laughs>